Bjorn is a really interesting character in The Hobbit because there's nothing quite like him in Tolkien's earlier writings. Even though it's just a children's story, it was written as an adventure for his own children, he's still packing it with the most amazingly rich and wonderfully powerful characters. The character of Bjorn from the book is this giant, powerful, dangerous character, but he also is very gentle in his own right. You can read The Hobbit and think, oh, Bjorn's sort of a big, jolly woodsman, but behind that, there's a much fiercer Bjorn whose story isn't really ever told, but there's a hint of Bayorn's true nature in the book. A goblin's head was stuck outside the gate, and a wag skin was nailed to a tree just beyond. Bayorn was a fierce enemy. I think that's Tolkien's hint as to what he could have done with Bayorn had he not been writing a children's book. I said once that uh, Bayorn uh, was the least invented character in Middle-earth. Tolkien more or less created Bjorn out of old legends, out of old folk tales, out of lost tales that he reconstructed. First thing, uh, Tolkien was fascinated by the old English poem Beowulf. Beowulf is the story of one of the great heroes of the North, and he goes on a journey to defeat the monster Grindel. What does Beowulf mean? Well, in old English, it means the wolf of the bees. And if you've read Winnie the Pooh, you know that the wolf of the bees is the bear. And Beowulf, although in the epic he's a perfectly human hero, he's very like a bear. He's terribly strong. And he says, when I killed the Frankish standard bearer, my warlike grasp broke his house of bones and crushed out the pulses of his heart. Sounds like a bear hug to me. In addition to Beowulf being a likely source for the character Bjorn, there's also the Old Norse saga of Bothvar Bjarki, who was the king's champion. Uh, and in the great battle in which the king finally dies, Bothvar Bjarki manages to summon up a giant bear. The bear was Bothvar's sending, a kind of astral projection of himself, which is knocking people down and biting them and crushing them to death. Now, there's 700 years between Beowulf and the saga of Bothvar, and there's not the slightest possibility that the author of the saga knew the poem Beowulf. But they've both got the same bear's son kind of character, so the bear's son fairy tale must have been there from way back. We know that there was once a story called the Bjarkismal, the folk tale, about a feral child raised by bears that goes all the way back to the legends before recorded history. It takes the whole notion of the universe back to such an archaic period. Some of the first images we have are of bears. Some of the first sacred burials have bear skulls. So what was man's relationship to bears? Tolkien touches on it with Bayorn. Tolkien, I think, is like a fossil hunter who finds a bone here and a bone there fragments of uh, the ancient legends and the ancient myths. And I think that Tolkien actually worked out his own idea of what the Bear's Son fairy tale must have been. The thing about Bear's Sons is maybe they have an option. And the option is they are Egi Einhammer. They are people who have more than one skin. Well, that's Beorn, isn't it? Professor Tolkien, he's drawn on a lot of different sources in order to create Bayon, but he is in and of himself quite unique to the mythology of the Hobbit. Bjorn lives on the edge of Mirkwood on his own, surrounded by animals. He's kind of a farmer, very much a kind of guardian of the woods and the pastures. He really is something of a hermit. To some degree, he is not on anybody's side. I mean, he literally is suspicious of anybody. You don't know if he is your friend or enemy. He is not what he seems. He is quite a dangerous guy, actually. Even in his human form, there is something wild about him. Standing near was a huge man with a thick black beard and hair, and great bare arms and legs with knotted muscles. 
most depictions of Bayorn up until now have been really sort of a big, tall, mountain man kind of frontier figure. We definitely went back to the original descriptions of, of how he was portrayed and described by Tolkien. That was our sort of starting point. We wanted to see how far we could push this wild, frightening quality as a man that you're really not quite sure what way he's going to go. I actually really liked this idea of the kind of big sideburns, the wild sort of sideburns. It did give him a little bit more of a bestial kind of feeling. Ultimately, one Nick Keller illustration really captured a, a beast-like nature into his demeanor. I was trying to explore a wild quality to him, something a little bit animalistic about it, but still kind of a, a noble carry. And his costuming in that illustration was simplistic, but not unsophisticated. But it wasn't until Michael actually was cast and we started thinking about him as Bayon that we really started to get a lock on what he could be. Hi, my name is Michael Persbrandt and this is a screen test as Bjorn in The Hobbit. We did a screen test in my house in uh, Sweden, Scandinavia. My people were the first to live in the mountains before the orcs came down from the north. They killed most of my kind. And I did that, and then we waited a couple of weeks, and then they called, and they wanted me to fly down to London to do an additional screen test with Peter. What did you do with them? Tell me, or I will tear you apart with my bare hands. When Mikhail auditioned, he had a, a sort of a sense of an animal, an animal kind of strength, and he really felt like he wasn't quite of our world. Bayon has this air of danger, like it could explode at any time. And Mikhail helped with that perfectly in his portrayal of Bayon because he was a bit scary. I went in to meet some wolves in a wild park before I came here. And I sat down and the, the leader wolf came, came to me and was talking to me in a way doing this uh, with his teeth around me. And I was not afraid of him, because <laughs> I have this belief in myself that I can break his neck, of course. <laughs> One week later, he um, ate up uh, his uh, his keepers. One of them, yes. She went in, she was probably stumbling over something. And when you fall, they just react on it, as something is clicking in their head. They went for her, dead. Super dead. Same thing with Bjorn. Don't stumble around him. So you specifically went to see those wolves as part of your research? No, no, I was there instead with my kids. He's really intimidating, but not, not when you get to know him. He's great. He's such a charmer. He's brilliant. Mikhail, ooh, what an extraordinary actor. Dory and Ori, at your service. I don't want your service. Well. <laughs> And a Swedish Hulk. You know, he's the sex symbol of Sweden. Yeah. 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 I'm a dirty animal. When you think about the practicalities of, of an animal turning into a human being or vice versa, you'd expect to see some kind of traces or some, some kind of evidence of it on either side. The question with Bayorn really was, how much of the bear is in the man. And so we looked at different ways that we could treat his beard and his hair and having some bearish qualities in his face, even when he was in human form. Peter wanted the man not to be just uh, an ordinary man and to add in this kind of animal elements. I imagined his hair running all the way down his back. It's a way to, to sort of emphasize that he's not fully human. When we came to designing the hair for the Bayon, Peter came over to the makeup room. He said, I don't want it to look like Grizzly Adams or anything like that. He wanted a, a cross between a human and something that could become a bear. And then he said, I've got so much hair in the movie, is there something else we can do? So we came up with the idea of actually using horse hair, because it's coarser. It's to give it a, an animalistic feeling, but actually still a man rather than an animal. When we made the wig and the facial hair, which was like two huge, almost 19th century beard things, but they were shaped in such a way to look otherworldly. Looks kind of human, you know, <laughs> kind of. A little bit strange, though. <laughs> it's like a, a mixture between 
some hard rocker from the 70s and a horse in full speed. It's me and Rod Stewart. When Michael first arrived in New Zealand, we revealed to him that it was our intention to put him in some type of prosthetics, which it's fair to say he was a bit anxious about. I don't actually think Mikel knew what he was in for. Oh, man. Peter Jackson likes to change appearances and, and push the boundaries. I did some head casts and um, stuff in London, and then I started to realize uh, there might be ears, there might be new news. If I'm lucky, I get a six pack and then. <laughs> <laughs> he brings his own six pack. Yeah, it was more than I expected, but still, I got away easier than some of the dwarves. I like the idea of something with his nose, bridge of his nose, to make him feel like his bone structure wasn't quite human. We're trying to give him the impression that his uh, nose is more bear-like. Yeah, the, he has this incredible dignity about mm. him. We started off with the most extreme, working towards the most subtle. This is the old one. And that's what we sculpted it back to. OK. And that's what's on his face. But aren't we trying to evoke an animal in his nose? For me, it's how sympathetically mm. he yeah. reads. And, and uh, <laughs> a more it's bright eyes. <laughs> <laughs> we chose one um, that was a little bit Eric Roberts, <laughs> boxer nose kind of way. And then Bayorn had teeth made at Weta specifically just to give them something to change the structure of his own beautiful white teeth. We gave them two fangs, slightly animal fangs, but they're just enough to sort of, if you get a glimpse of them, you know that they're scary. It makes it a little bit uh, sharper uh, in the corners, up and down, like, like a bear. <laughs> so I'm happy with uh, saying that it's only a nose job and teeth. <laughs> and that happens to many people in Hollywood, I think, without, yeah, they shapeshift a lot there. <laughs> and now I want to get this rid of. Luckily, I can take it off when the day is done. This feels like taking off your ski boots after 10 hours in a ski mm. snow. Mm. I love Mikkel. I mean, the man's covered in tattoos of his own accord. They tell a story of his crazy life. Have they all got meanings or not? Yes, they have. Uh, all except one that I uh, took away. Oh, that's what that's that was her. That was a full moon party in uh, Thailand. It was a what? Full moon party in Thailand? It didn't have much meaning, that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, go on. <laughs> and I said, and here you went, f the whole world. No, I can't. F the whole world. <laughs> but I got this. He didn't do that. <laughs> I was so happy when I woke up by the pool. Yeah, OK. Thank you for today, girls and boys. <laughs> <laughs>In terms of a design brief for Bayorn's costume, we were very much looking at a character who is self-sufficient, very masculine, very rugged. Yeah. So long as it doesn't feel like it's falling off his shoulders, it doesn't... Yeah. Like, You're right, you don't want it to look like it's about to fall off. I think we should put a, an extra hole up, up there. Yeah. Hole's already there. Oh, is it? Oh, there you go. You see, you were thinking ahead. Holy God, look at that. With Bayorn being, of course, an animal lover and a shape changer and basically an animal himself at times, we had to be very aware that we couldn't use any animal products in his costume making. The idea being that Bayon lives in harmony with the animals that he cares for. They're his friends, and so he doesn't use animal skins or anything like that. The only things he'll use are things that the animals can give away, like a little bit of wool that's cast off or something like that. In the tunic itself, we created a net. We're weaving Bayon's tunic. How many of those little knots have you tied today? Thousands and thousands. That he then wove through the wool that had come off his sheep and the various goats that may have been caught in the brambles, and he just roughly rolls it together and threads it through. So we wanted it to be something that he had created in his own sensibilities. But he also needed to have a sense of a, a civilization that he belonged to, a culture that he had. My people were the first to live in the mountains before the orcs came down from the north. The idea that, that Bayon comes from the north, I think one of the things about the acoustic choice of using Michael's Swedish accent, he's definitely from somewhere that is very different from everyone else that we're hearing on screen. You will leave my opponents before you enter the forest. 
I will collect them. You have my word. Mikhail's Scandinavian, and I, I think having that 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 accent sort of added something to him as well. Apesum. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Apesum. Awesome. Obviously, my English is not tip top. Oh, that's the mice. Mouse. Mice. One mice, two mouses. No. One. I had to go back to school. And so, using Michael's accent, you do have a feeling that there is a whole other history to him. This character, Bjorn, is one of a kind. It's not like you and me. He's something else. You're very, you're, you're kind of, you're half animal still. You, you might have physically changed, but your, your, your psychology, your, your, your whole emotional state is still very much a bear. The whole idea of being able to change into a bear is a specifically Norse concept. It relates to the berserkers. The berserkers are a really interesting part of Viking history. The name comes from berserk, bear shirt, because they fought like animals, they fought like bears. They can enter this extraordinary state of rage brought on by extreme necessity in battle. The human berserker is a male soldier that is fighting and reaches that level of bloodlust and insane, crazed mentality. And Tolkien definitely visualized in Bjorn the absolute extreme of that, where he just goes into this animalistic, crazed, killing uh, frenzy. Bears are tricky because, you know, there was a TV show when I was a kid called Gentle Ben, which the hippie talking fans are all going to remember. And all the way through the Bayonne discussions, I just kept thinking, oh, he can't be Gentle Ben, he can't be Gentle Ben. The original brief for Bayonne in bear form was to experiment and to, to go wide. Obviously, a bear is a starting point for him, but Peter was interested in seeing a range of different designs. Every evening, I would go home and do a Bayonne sketch or two. And often, it's the very quick, loose sketch which opens up more possibilities. So Peter asked us to try a broad array of werebear-like creatures. The term werebear stuck, you know, instead of a werewolf, he's a werebear. We started out doing a lot of stuff that was pretty monstrous. So when he was in his bear form, he was really, really freaky looking and, and kind of distorted. Peter was interested in seeing different amounts of bear to human proportions and various body parts. His spine may distort, his, even his face and his jaw may be offset so that you end up with this quite hideous creature that is not of our world. The only thing I'd say about that is that I think the arm um, difference is too pronounced. It feels a bit like a genetic experiment gone wrong. It just doesn't quite have the naturalness that I think it needs. We're kind of like horrible Frankenstein doctors in a way. <laughs> Gus Hunter had done these amazing drawings with the torn away fur revealing flesh underneath. And that ultimately led to the beautiful Marquette that Jamie Bess Warwick did. Beyond in his final bear form, hopefully. <laughs> there was a Marquette that I've done that was sort of mid transformation. So he was going into sort of an absolute berserker rage. Then the design shifted the werebear designs definitely started looking in a bit more in the grotesque realm, which is why I think we moved away from that area. It was very difficult to try and make it feel sublime and, and add any of that regalness to the design that I think he warranted, being that he wasn't a villain. Fram felt quite firmly that a reconsideration needed to be given to maybe there is a simplicity and a respect back to the original literature of Bayorn becoming just a bear. So it's, OK, well, he's got to be a bear, but do bears in Middle-earth look exactly the same as our bears? I don't think they have to at all. This is like, you know, an ancient version of, of our world. And so we looked at prehistoric bears, because obviously bears did have wonderful iterations in prehistory that ultimately evolved into the bear of today. One of the things that Peter responded to with the design was bulking him up and making him a lot bigger. We made really big shoulders and also playing with that motif of the hair, bringing him right up to the shoulders, so it made him feel very powerful. We always felt like, let's give him some of those personality traits like you would see in his human form. So you would make that relationship. So something like the hair was playing up to that mohawk and the sort of sideburns that come down, which made him feel a little bit more like Bjorn the bear rather than um, just any other bear. The bulk of the final design was done by Andrew Baker. 
and Nweta Digital ultimately took it over as they built Bayorn the bear as we see in the movie. As we got into the final stages of the design of, of Bjorn, Peter decided that he could be more dramatic and John Howard did another pass on the design at that stage. That gave him a, a hump behind his head, more like a wild boar than, than a bear. We took his fur and made it mangy and matted and we worked in the scarring on his face and on his body. And then his fur color changed to being very black. And it's just another way of of making him look scary and formidable. But at the same time, it adds this history to his character, this backstory where it feels like he's been in battles. Yeah, we, we certainly deliberately try to make him a little bit more dangerous looking, so we actually changed the bone structure of the bear. We did change some of his anatomy. His, his knees were in slightly different position. His haunches were a little bit lower than a normal bear. And this was really so we could change the way his, his stride was. Bears kind of run with a hop or a gallop where the front feet land at the same time and the back feet run, land at the same time. And it's not the scariest thing to look at. It never looks like they're really charging or they're charging, they're just galloping along. So we went and took a pass on quite a bit of the animation just to break up the feet. When we copied real bear cycles, it was really only one foot off the ground ever. When you see Bayorn running, we had three feet off the ground and only one touching, more lion-like, so it's barely touching the ground. We really wanted him exploding out of the trees. Open the door! Quickly! So one of the challenges we had in dealing with Bjorn as a character, as a man and as a bear, we wanted some certain physical characteristics to tie the two together. Mikhail has these piercing blue eyes, and we originally gave Bjorn the bear the same piercing blue eyes. Because we were actually making the bear digitally, we thought, let's try giving the bear more human eyes. But these very piercing blue eyes didn't help the bear to look menacing. Very late in the game, we decided that his eyes looked too sympathetic. So we made Bjorn the bear's eyes this deep chocolatey brown. But then we also went through and replaced Bjorn the man's eyes to give his eyes a slightly more animal feel. So this is Bjorn uh, as he was. So this is what we had when we started. Those are the actor's eyes. Here's where we're going to change the color of those irises. And then making the pupils bigger. What we had before was that. And there's the change. And you see most of the uh, sclera hasn't really changed. It's just the iris and the pupil. We also made some changes to his hair. We made it a little bit less high. And once we started seeing it in lots of shots, it, it started to draw too much attention to itself. So Fran and Pete really wanted to do was to squash it down some. So we actually ended up flattening his mohawk and just bringing it in a little. And we added a bit of grayness and some, you know, some sort of streaks and darker bits and lighter bits. But the big job is the eyes. The stroke of genius of transferring the bear's eyes to, to Beyond just shifted him into a completely different zone. I thought it was a very, very remarkable and very, very successful decision. Bayon is a special character because we never really meet his like again. In The Lord of the Rings, there's a reference to a character called Grimbjorn who's described as being Bayon's son. Uh, and he's a Bjorning, who are the people that live in this realm. What isn't exactly explicit is whether or not they have the ability to skin change the way Bayon does, and it's left for the imagination. Therefore, we're free to interpret, but uh, maybe that's on purpose, because, you know, that's what myth and imagination are all about. Tolkien really, I think, intentionally left Bjorn quite undefined. We don't know what happens to him after the events of The Hobbit. Does he wander off into the mountains and disappear? Does he turn into a bear one day and then never change back? There's something very dark and sad about him, I think. But you can't forget that character. It's actually very moving because you realize when Bayorn is no more, then Middle-earth will be very, very different. <laughs> <laughs>